This is part two of the lecture on laryngeal subsites for staging squam cell carcinoma. This lecture will make a lot more sense if you have watched part one. Okay, let's focus a little more on the fat planes in the supraglottis. So for reference, this is the petiole of the epiglottis, and this is the hyoid bone. This U-shaped configuration of fat here represents the preepiglottic and the paraglottic fat. The preepiglottic fat, as we discussed, is anterior to the petiole of the epiglottis, and the paraglottic fat is laterally on either side. This looks like one continuous plane of fat. There is a fascial plane between these, but it's usually not evident radiologically. Here is the paraglottic fat as seen in the coronal plane. You can almost think of the paraglottic fat as an extension up of the fat that fills the false vocal cords, extending up further superiorly into the uh, into the supraglottis. And you can imagine how a tumor that arises within the false vocal cords is prone to secondarily invade the paraglottic fat. Here's an example of a tumor involving both the preepiglottic fat, this is the petiole of the epiglottis, those are the area epiglottic folds, in the preepiglottic fat and coming out laterally here to the paraglottic fat, relative sparing of the paraglottic fat on the contralateral side, so both involved here. This is really important for us to establish radiologically because it will often render these patients non-surgical, or rather it will uh, prevent a, a partial laryngectomy and force a total laryngectomy. Here's uh, that same example we were looking at earlier in, with the invasion of the preepiglottic fat. There probably is some infiltration of the paraglottic fat here as well with relative preservation on this side. This is the petiole of the epiglottis. Here's an example of involvement in the paraglottic fat. You can use the symmetry of the larynx to help you out seeing the uh, preserved paraglottic fat on this side in this coronal image. And you can see this necrotic tumor coming up and infiltrating into the inferior component of the paraglottic fat on the affected side. About laryngeal cartilages. This drawing, which was actually made by my daughter, Leah, is a representation of the external appearance of the laryngeal cartilages. And you can see the large thyroid cartilage with its ala on either side and its superior and inferior cornua. And you can see the complete ring of the cricoid cartilage, although uh, its back is covered by the thyroid cartilage. And that also means that you can't see the arytenoid cartilages. They're on the inside there, perched on top of the cricoid cartilage. If we uh, use one of Dr. Netter's diagrams to look at the interior surface here, we've cut the entire larynx in the sagittal plane and we're looking from the inside, we can see the large ala of the thyroid cartilage, we can see the petiole of the epiglottis and the epiglottis sticking up, there's that hyoepiglottic ligament that we talked about, and we can see the complete ring of the cricoid cartilage above the rings of the trachea. Now that we're on the inside, we can see the uh, retinoid cartilage perched atop the, um, the cricoid cartilage on either side of the cricoid cartilage. Unfortunately, the thyroid cartilage undergoes progressive ossification as we age. What this means is that we cannot rely on a consistent CT appearance of these cartilages. When we are young, there may be just a tiny amount of ossification within the uh, thyroid cartilage and the rest of the cartilage is about the same density as muscle, very hard to see. This ossification will occur irregularly, and we might get some anterior ossification with spared areas of cartilage, or we may get some posterior ossification with the anterior portion of the thyroid cartilage and its prominence out front um, uh, incompletely ossified. And eventually, we may get complete ossification of the thyroid cartilage. The problem with this all four of these are normal, by the way. The problem with this is that when we are trying to assess for erosion 
of the thyroid cartilage, we're often looking for disruptions in the cortex, in this ossified cortex. But it's hard to know whether those disruptions are a natural part of the ossification or whether it is truly tumor erosion. We are somewhat helped by the fact that this is usually a symmetric process. It's not perfect though, and even there we can run into some trouble. So that's the big challenge with thyroid cartilage uh, erosion is distinguishing uh, normal ossification patterns, which can be very irregular, from erosions, which can be very irregular. Here's an example of cricoid cartilage erosion. You can see the, uh, the, the circle of the cricoid cartilage here interrupted right there with an erosive mass. Notice that there is sclerosis of the cartilage adjacent to the erosions. This is typical of cartilages within the larynx that are affected by tumor. There will first be um, a, a reactive sclerosis that may occur in the absence of, of true erosion, uh, and then the more discrete erosion of the cartilage. This is typical in the larynx. Now the problem with that is that the arytenoid cartilages will often undergo physiologic sclerosis. This is normal. Right? Some 30% of people will have asymmetric sclerosis of their arytenoid cartilages. This is a normal person. There's no tumor here, but that asymmetry is physiologic. At the same time, as I just said, tumor will cause sclerosis. And here's an example of scler uh, asymmetric sclerosis in an arytenoid cartilage because of this tumor of the true vocal cords that spread back to the cartilage. So how can you tell these two apart? Well, whenever I see sclerosis in a cartilage that is adjacent to tumor, I'm going to assume that it's because of the tumor and not coincidental physiologic uh, sclerosis. Although some of the time that will undoubtedly be the case. When we're evaluating the thyroid cartilage for erosions, it's very important to distinguish whether it is only the inner cortex of the thyroid cartilage that is eroded or whether both the inner and outer cortices are eroded and the tumor has spread outside the cartilaginous boundaries of the larynx. It makes a big difference for staging. So here's an example where the outer cortex is intact, but the inner cortex has been eroded by tumor. You can even see a little bit of sclerosis, as promised, adjacent to the area of erosion. Don't rely on that, though. It's a more difficult example. It's more difficult in a couple of ways, mostly because of the ossification pattern in the thyroid. We're worried about an area of cartilage that is incompletely ossified to begin with. So here's our tumor. Do we feel like this thyroid cartilage is eroded? Well, the fact that we have abnormal enhancement that comes right up to the expected location of the inner table of the uh, thyroid cartilage, that the inner cortex of the, of the thyroid cartilage, that is going to be enough to make us concerned about thyroid cartilage invasion. Here's a, a more explicit example where it looks like a tiny rat bite of, uh, of cartilage along the uh, inner cortex there and some surrounding sclerosis. Here's an example where it is both inner and outer table involvement. Uh, this tumor definitely involves the inner table here, but now you can see it extend out through the outer table and there is in fact extralaryngeal spread of tumor into the strap muscles overlying the, uh, the larynx here. So explicit spread through inner and outer cortex of the thyroid cartilage. Many people feel that MRI is the best way to evaluate for cartilage invasion. Um, and it, MRI definitely has some advantages over CT, especially in the multiple sequences. So here we can see an unenhanced T one-weighted sequence and an ossified cartilage will have marrow in it. So you can see the disruption of that marrow fat by the tumor that has eroded through both uh, the inner and outer cortex. Uh, T2-weighted imaging is uh, considered one of the best ways to uh, evaluate it, and so you're looking for abnormal T2 signal, again, disrupting the normal fat in this ossified cartilage, but it will also produce abnormal T2 signal in unossified cartilage. And uh, enhancement uh, can be very, very useful, but there's a problem that is uh, the, the, the cartilage that 
is next to a tumor but has not been invaded will sometimes have abnormal enhancement. You need to make sure that the enhancement and the T2 signal abnormality that you are seeing within the cartilage is the exact same color as the enhancement and T2 signal abnormality of the tumor itself. The cartilage can react. You can have a reactive edema within the cartilage without definitive invasion. So it has to be the same color. The tumor and the interior of the cartilage have to be the same color. What this means is that MRI is, while very sensitive for cartilage invasion, is nonspecific. It's easy to overcall an MRI. CT, on the other hand, is very specific. When you see it, it's almost certainly there. But you might miss one of these more subtle cases that is only evident on the MRI. Which one is better? Well, one's more sensitive and one's more specific. We're going to talk about hypopharyngeal cancer as it relates to laryngeal cancers. Um, in order to understand hypopharyngeal cancer, you under need to understand the subsites of the, of the hypopharynx. Uh, there is a portion of the hypopharynx that is right behind the larynx, right behind the cricoid cartilage called the postcricoid region. And then out on either side are the piriform sinuses. Uh, I've chosen this example of a hypopharyngeal tumor because the entire hypopharynx is uniformly involved. So it kind of shows the hypopharynx. Well, normally this is collapsed down to just a couple of layers of mucosa, and it's very hard to see this anatomy. That's why I'm showing a tumor case. There's two ways for the hypopharynx and the larynx to be involved in a single cancer. One is you have a laryngeal cancer that spreads secondarily back to the hypopharynx. The other is you have a primary hypopharyngeal cancer that spreads anterior to the larynx. It is often hard to tell which of those occurred, and it may not matter that much from the surgical approach. But here's a situation where pretty clearly most of the bulk of this is here in the larynx, but you can see that there's extension back and abnormal enhancement with abnormal tissue in this half of the hypopharynx, both the piriform sinus and the postcricoid region in this half of the hypopharynx. This is secondary involvement of the hypopharynx from the larynx, and it has a dramatic impact on surgical planning. Another really important thing to consider when we are dealing with a hypopharyngeal cancer or a posterior extent uh, of a larynx cancer into the hypopharynx is the, is the, is the concept of prevertebral invasion. If the uh, prevertebral fascia has been violated and there is extensive tumor into the prevertebral tissues, uh, that patient is considered inoperable. It makes a big difference in their planning. Uh, some people advocate for MRI as the best way to assess for prevertebral invasion. What they're relying on there is edema within the prevertebral musculature that occurs because of the tumor invasion. Um, however, in my opinion, um, flor fluoroscopy is actually an even better way to assess for prevertebral invasion. Normally, your pharynx has extensive excursion relative to your vertebral column when you swallow. In fact, your, uh, your larynx should rise about two vertebral bodies every time you swallow. If there is prevertebral invasion, you have tethered the mucosa of your pharynx to the prevertebral tissues, and you can no longer have that movement. So when patients with prevertebral invasion swallow, they have less than half a vertebral body height of excursion, and this is an excellent way uh, to test for prevertebral uh, invasion. So what path does a cancer actually take when it's going from the larynx to the hypopharynx or vice versa? The answer is that it tends to spread through this interval between the thyroid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage. Notice on the normal side that the thyroarytenoid gap, this distance between thyroid and retinoid cartilage, the thyroarytenoid gap is very small. But once it's been infiltrated by tumor, it expands. And this enhancing tumor is separating the thyroid cartilage from the arytenoid cartilage and expanded thyroarytenoid gap. This is a very important clue of spread between the larynx and the hypopharynx a widened thyroretinoid gap. So that's a quick review of the laryngeal anatomy as it pertains to the staging of squamous cell carcinoma arising in the larynx.